Um, well, welcome everybody. We're doing our second uh, episode on adventure culture, and we're here with our boy Solom. And it's good to be on here. Episode two. Yeah, episode two, baby. Leo. Nice to see you again, see you. Rumi. And all right, so we're uh, so we're basically doing both the introductions of what Leo's venture is and a little bit of his story, and also learning all about Soham's interesting life with his uh, CS journey and uh, all his experience around corporate and uh, also startup uh, culture. So I guess we'll. Uh, I don't know, let's start with Leo first. All right. Tell us a little bit about your venture, about your, uh, you know, just uh, introduce yourself a yeah. bit and tell me a, a bit about what you're doing. So um, I own and operate a media company whose purpose is to um, find, locate people who are starting their own ventures, is specifically in, in areas of sales and solicitation. So somebody who might be doing real estate or uh, financial investment sales and then helping them with mitigating their own personal image into their brand image and combine the two and turn that into the product image and then advertise that image um, as basically their product to turn themselves into the product. Um, you know, re oh, sorry, I should say representative of the product that they are selling. And um, then from that point on to instill a sense of trust with the audience. Um, with whoever might be interested. I see. So pretty much like you take any professionals who have a, where their profession, like their brand image is really important and you connect their personal, like their personal life and their career kind of together, right? Into one. In a sense, you know, uh, in a sense, so. To improve their reputation. I guess. Yeah, uh, more so it's about because these people starting up, um, they need a sense of uh, security. Everybody that, you know, their clients need to seek a sense of security from them. Mm. And that comes in the form of trust yeah. and in the form of recognition. So what I do is I take their image and basically put it as, you know, their brand, turn their image into their brand. That way that, you know, people recognize the brand. I market them in such a way that uh, when somebody looks at them even on social media for around like 10 seconds or something they recognize them and they associate their image with the product that they are selling i see so you're basically doing media and uh digital marketing well yeah digital marketing yeah. but then putting personal branding into to like the yeah. focus and yeah. yeah i see i see that's a uh, very interesting and well, what got you into creating this type of business and uh, just deciding to do your own thing? Well, I started doing my own thing uh, when I was approximately 15, 16 years old. I started off with uh, doing fashion design and doing, and then I moved on into um, being a intermediary between, you know, uh, factories and the micro brands that, you know, that's creating limited releases. And through that journey, I realized that um, although it is profitable doing um, being an intermediary, however, what these like brands needed the most, as they are startups, was that they needed they needed recognition and um, recognition from their clients, from more people. So they need a source which you know can help them to branch out and reach as many people as possible and then i realized that you know it is ultimately about connecting people to other people yeah and that's what i truly enjoy in this line of business is the human relationships that we can formulate from promote promotion of one another i see what are like throughout your uh career so far running your media agency and business like mm -hmm. can you name some like really interesting scenarios or interesting people you've come across or like interesting outcomes i guess well um one of the things i i would never have dreamt about was the fact that you know as back then when i owned my own personal uh, brand and design studio i could leverage my position as the owner and ceo 
uh, and use that position to kind of get an audience with uh, celebrities. Mm-hmm. And um, one of these celebrities of which is uh, shout out Nono from uh, Higher Brothers, one of the biggest rap groups in China. Oh, wow. Um, it wasn't through me directly, but uh, I did manage through a shared connection to um, put a one of my designs on him and have him post it. That's and- amazing. That was very good. Yeah, one of the it's craziest cool. experiences I had, and I can't thank my connection enough for this. I see. I see. All right. And uh, well, so home. Tell me something you can talk about for hours. I mean, there's several things, but off the top of my head, probably number one, food. Okay. Number two, um, I'm really into... I guess my theories on spirituality, religion, and consciousness. Right. Some, uh, some like, you know, time travel, <laughs> what time you yeah. meet, you know, like you get into, get into that another time. But number three, I think I can talk about, uh, I guess similar to, um, similar to Leo, I think I can, I can give decent advice on how to market yourself in terms of, um, uh, direct career paths so like someone looking for a new job or something i feel like uh many people really don't understand the fundamental skills in terms of how to market themselves when looking for a new job career path or branch out so i think uh being uh being a water student about to go into fourth year um they gather a decent amount of experience about that I so let's uh, talk a little bit about your background so yeah can show sure. us yeah well, yeah so- um, I'm in the same, same year as, uh, Santi and Leo. So I'm a three beat Waterloo computer science student now. And when I first came to Waterloo, I originally joined the double degree program. So I was doing a uh, bachelor's of business administration at Laurier and then computer science at Waterloo. And I did three years of the BBA undergrad, but I kind of did not really I really enjoyed it anymore, and I realized it was like my time was more valuable uh, spent on on other things such as like career or focusing more more uh, specifically on computer science. So right now, um, I'm kind of in the position where I'm exploring a lot of new new things, you know, like creating some companies and startups and ideas of my own, and also you know trying to get a really uh, wide variety of work experience i see yeah and uh i'm gonna put a pin on your uh, your project but for i really want to ask you uh why did you decide waterloo having you know probably a pretty good amount of opportunities to move forward after high school why was yeah. waterloo a personality like, i think um i think the main thing for me like i was pretty indecisive in high school i knew my strengths but at the same time I knew what the most practical route was, which is I want to be able to make the highest salary at the youngest age, which is like, it sounds obvious, right? But it is kind of the obvious thing. When you think of that, you have to kind of link it to in this modern day computer science or even just in the tech industry itself. Like you don't have to be a computer science role, but working for these big tech companies, that's how you secure that salary. So um, I kind of knew, okay, computer science pays really well. Anything in the business field also pays really well. And usually um, you only have to do a four-year undergrad. And most of these companies aren't necessarily looking for a master's or PhD. So uh, I, I guess it was that combination. So um, I knew I had to make the most amount of money. I knew I had to take a four-year undergrad. And in order to secure these big, these uh, these jobs that pay the maximum amount of salary, I need to be able to market myself to my maximum potential and make sure I have as many things stacked up as possible to increase my chances. So I think like the obvious route was to go to uh, go to Waterloo since they have the biggest uh, biggest name in the general tech industry in terms of schools from Canada, other than like the US schools. So I think uh, it was just a combination of uh, those. I see, so you just uh, looked at it very rationally and uh, decided what was the best way to get to your goals yeah, like, in a, the quickest yeah, way as well. Like what field of computer science I wanted to go into, or even if I would stay with computer science, I just knew 
Waterloo is going to force me to do a bunch of internships. I'm going to figure out what I like throughout these internships. And regardless, even if I'm not satisfied with the jobs, I still have this great name to help me um, when I'm fighting with my new grad jobs. Right. And uh, was it hard to get into Waterloo? I mean, like, of course it's hard. Like for some people, I guess it's objective based on how hard they find their high school courses and stuff. But in general, um, it was definitely a challenge. I mean, I'm not... Um, I definitely did not shy away from the work, especially in 12th grade. Like, I think even till now, I was the most organized, productive, and responsible in my 12th grade because, like, it's kind of my mindset was okay, once I'm, once I'm in Waterloo, then I'm chilling, you know, like, yeah. and I can kind of slack off, slow down, but I just say, like, I really need to keep powering through. So, I know yeah. it's a sacrifice that probably took a few years, but then once you're in, kind of okay oh yeah exactly like when you're young that's the time to like what do you really have you're living at home your your rent's being paid for your food's being paid for you like what do you what do you really need to do with your time you'll have all the time later on once you have your freedom right so, and it's really it's so hustled out what would you say i know a lot of people are who's listening to this will wonder uh, especially the our young audience out there mm -hmm. um who's going into computer science and one of the questions is whether you know is it easier to go into computer science than to stay in computer science mm. i think um i think like being at waterloo for example there's a decent amount of people that draw out of computer science there's also a decent amount of people that rework really hard like there i know a lot of students who get into math for example and they work really hard just to get into computer science. So I think it is kind of both ends of the spectrum. I think uh, if you're already in Waterloo, then I feel like you're going to be able to um, handle some of the some uh, some of the course loads and how difficult the courses are. I think um, in general, let's say you just go to a general computer science undergrad at like any school. I think a lot of the times people will get bored or what really uh, expect the type of coursework you do with computer science. Because at Waterloo, for example, probably 70, 80% of our coursework is all written, theory, mathematical. It's very much the theory versus application. Like, we're not going to sit down and do be doing a lot of, like, industry-related coding tasks or projects um, that may be more software engineering because engineering is a bit more application. But I think uh, something to be prepared for in computer science is definitely you're going to be doing a decent amount of math. That's number one. And uh, number two, like get ready to really like uh, be prepared to not know anything and also being like uh, learning to learn. I think that's one yeah. of the most important things because it's not necessarily your undergrad will get easier as you go on. The courses are going to become more complex and yes, might be a bit less work, but it's mainly after these years and years of going through school, you learn your own tricks and tips in terms of how you learn the best, and that's what will carry you throughout. I see. And at the same time, uh, I feel like the screening to just get into a program is so strict. You know, they, yeah. they ask you for high 90s, almost 100 nowadays, and uh, all these extracurriculars that come with it, that if, if, you already, if you're already getting into the program, you're most likely to have quite a bit of, you know, initial knowledge to carry on through your first uh, few years and uh, at least uh, at a, a studying method way or... Uh... So honestly, like for me, I, I, I know like a, a lot of students who come to Waterloo, specifically for computer science, they do a lot of it since uh, since a young age. Like it was kind of like instilled into that. For me, it was kind of the opposite. It was more of like my first computer science course was in like grade ten or grade eleven. So I really knew limited amount of coding and stuff, just uh, enough so I could do these like uh, extra Waterloo co uh, computer science competitions. Which, uh, if anyone is watching who wants to go to Waterloo, I would highly recommend. It. They're called the CCC, and they're meant for uh, high school students to do. And when you apply your score, like low or high, it's going to help your application. So I think, uh, I think 
in general, I, I definitely do a lot. Of, I, I know a lot of students who came with previous knowledge and ones who did it. But I think regardless, Waterloo does is very rigorous. It, it, it is a very rigorous school. So like uh, the way you study and stuff did definitely change for me because the concepts and the things I learned in class were a lot harder to wrap my head around. So yeah. I see. <laughs> and before we move any further, we're just going to take a break right now. And when we return, we're going to talk about the co-op experience yeah. as a computer science student. Good. Excited to get into that. Okay. So sure, let's... um. Sorry, wait a second. And now that you've been in, in Waterloo for three years and done a couple of co-ops, um, why you, are you deciding to come come up with your own startup idea and your own projects? Yeah, so um, I think uh, one of the things that I've seen at Waterloo is there's a really big hustle culture behind purely chasing these big name companies and stuff. And what I always think is that, um, like, regardless of whether you're working at a big name or a small name, you're getting employed purely off the fact that um, after this interview process and evaluation, this company thinks that you can make them some money. And they're just going to give you enough that seems, uh, that obviously seems enticing. So, like, the higher pay you get in reality, the company's making, uh, could be even exponential amounts of money off you so i think uh for me doing a lot of co-ops at smaller companies and startups number one it built the confidence that i can design and take a product from the drawing board to implementation test it and uh, be able to do the marketing and business side have a general concept at least um so that confidence also aligned with the fact that i know for for a fact that once I get enough job experience at, at various companies full time, my goal will 100% be to start my own company because uh, I don't want to be working under someone um, after a certain point. Like I kind of see it as like if you look at like a graph, right, of like of like where you stand in terms of your age and efficiency. When you're young, that's the time to first of all jump through different jobs, make a bunch of mistakes, and learn. The main thing is learn. When you join these big companies and you see these really talented, talented engineers that have 20 plus years of experience or who lead like uh, full departments of machine learning, blah, blah, blah. You, it's literally a gold mine, especially when you're young, because like when you have this knowledge, the younger you are, it's it becomes something exponential in terms of what you can uh, do with it. Because once you're... 40, 50, 60 years old, at that time, you don't have the energy when you're young anymore and the drive to really uh, want to start your own thing. Like you you may have a family, you, you have a lot, a lot of other stakes in your life at that point. So you can't just sacrifice um, a lot of things that you would be able to do when you're young. So I think uh, I just want to start getting the experience early. Number one, I know there's a lot of talented people around me and also I'm going to be able to continuously learn from the people at my work and the people I, I, I meet at Waterloo. But also number three, I'm young and now's the time to make these big risks and take on these big tasks. So why not, you know? Yes. Is, yeah. Do you think there's a factor of fear here that's, being, that's in play in terms of, you know, working for a corporation versus starting yourself? Do you Do you think that Later on, maybe down the line in 40 years, um, that if you were to go down this uh, path of working for corporates, that, you know, eventually you might look back at it and realize that this wasn't all I wanted. Have you thought about that? Yeah, for sure. Job? Like, I think, um, I think the main thing with me, which just sits kind of wrong is like, if I'm qualified for this job, if I'm being told I'm doing a great job, I'm getting these promotions. Yeah, it seems great on the surface level, but you have to really think about it. Someone else is harnessing my value from me and just giving giving me a token of appreciation, literally. Yeah. If you have all this value, all this experience from your years of working, then you know for a fact that you are capable of doing these great things. You just need a little bit of uh, a guidance and mentorship. But after these years, you'll gain that intuition. Um, 
if that is your goal, like I, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of people that are fine working until they're 40 or 50 and they're perfectly fine. Like they, they have the nice cushy job. They work six, seven hours a day. They come home to their family and that's great. But personally, that's not for me. I want to be the sole owner and I want to be the one pushing the direction and the vision of my company. And I know that um, when I'm young is the time to really, uh, to really get the most out of learning, you know? Yeah. And especially in my, in my own experience, I do know that um, the younger you are, the best it is to start taking these type of risks yeah. because everybody, you don't have it, any risks. And everybody's expecting you to fail pretty much, you know what I mean? So there is no, uh, there is no pressure. There is no social pressure for you to succeed. Yeah. And uh, it's honestly liberating for you to, exactly, for you to just be doing whatever you really want to do. And then, you know, the, the downside might be that you will go back to the regular job market in a year or so if things don't work out, you know, or just move on into a different startup. But it... You know, the the worst that could happen is that you learn. You know what I mean? It's not literally. The worst that could happen is you learn and you meet a, a bunch of great people. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, in, in my own experience, I, I think from one company, you know, it didn't do, do crazy good, but it took me to the next one, you know, and that's when I met so many other people. And then now we're doing the podcast and now we meet other people. So it's always, uh, it's always just... Uh, exponentially how you learn and how you network and it just uh, keeps building on your overall experience and knowledge and opportunities as well you know I think a common theme here is the fact that you know right now we are in a position to take risks and um, in my case my parents has always they always said to me that the benefits of a corporate job and they, why they want me to go into corporate uh, is that it is a sense of security where you're 40 or 50. Mm -hmm. um, it's the fact that, you know, maybe being in a corporate job, you don't make as much money, but um, you are able to consistently have a source yeah. of revenue. So that's one perspective to look at, you know, at everything. That's one thing that I think that everybody who's on the fence about starting a venture that really have to consider is that are they okay with the potential of foregoing of that sense of security later on down the line? Mm -hmm. Are they willing to take that risk? Right. And uh, at the end of the day, I feel like in many industries, people think that when you talk about creating a business, it has to be something huge. It's uh, but, you know, depending on certain careers that you're having, you can just be a freelancer, for example. And putting the same amount of work, uh, somewhat being risk uh, emergent and uh, have a pretty pretty good balance between life and work because I feel like that's some of the risks of having your your own thing is that you're responsible for everything therefore you don't have boundaries when it comes to personal life and a uh, professional life but I like how you talk, talk about the corporate because you did work in corporate I did work recently in corporate, right yes and it was a nice cushy job uh, it was a very low stress well I was fortunate enough for it to be low stress and at the end of the day it was about I, real, I came to the realization that, you know, people in life need the mass of like hierarchy of needs. We only need really l quite a little to live and we need a little bit more to be happy. So at the end of the day, being in corporate, yes, it will f fulfill my need. But will it fulfill my need to be happy personally? Because I see the potential that, you know, starting a venture can bring to me. And the potential that, you know, what I do and where it can turn out, basically. And I don't want to forgo that potential future for a sense of security. For me, the benefits just doesn't weigh the drawbacks here. I see. And uh, is, um, you also have worked in quite a bit of uh, startups and also other type of companies in your yeah. co-ops. How's your experience with that? Yeah, I think um, I think I definitely really think my most recent job was the most valuable to me in terms of it was really a fast paced startup environment, really small team, team of 12. Some people in our team were from different countries. They're working from different time zones. It was a really great experience because uh, um, 
it cleared a lot of misconceptions that I had when I think about like a startup because you always think a startup's just about innovation, innovation, innovation. Well, not necessarily because not every startup is going to be a huge unicorn, you know, like in like we see in Y Combinator. I think the the real benefit from a startup is that you feel the ownership behind it, so you'll never get tired of it because that is your baby that you created and you don't feel the mental exhaust exhaustion like of course you will feel it but it's not the same when it's your own thing like you constantly will have that drive and i think it's all about like everything just comes down to the customers that you have what's making them happy right now using your product and how can we continue that it's not always about creating the new and best thing because when you have such a small team every every any innovation, any change that could potentially create issues down the line, those issues are hugely magnified just because you have such a small amount of people. So everything gets pushed back, like your whole schedule will get pushed back. So I think uh, one of the biggest things I learned is really how to prioritize. I think that was a key thing I learned that prioritizing, sometimes you have to prioritize the really mundane, boring stuff. But that's what keeps your company going and that's what builds trust within your clients and users. It's not always about innovation. It's also about maintenance and also making sure that um, this vision that you started your company with, that vision is maintained. Right. Yeah. And when you're working on a startup, you get to be involved in a little bit of everything. Yeah, right? literally everything. Like, I, like, like I said, we're a group of, group of 12, so pretty much like every week would be almost like every other day we'd be pretty much talking with the whole teams you know um it was really 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 fun to pretty much at the start of the month we would be on the drawing board and then by the end by the end of the month we would all be reviewing the final implementation or product and then we would also be implementing use like user feedback and we'd be seeing what what sort of feedback you know be really interesting oh we change this tiny little feature or we do we uh change the marketing approach and then we take a look what's your feedback now uh what's our new seo strategy you know there's so many different pieces of the startup and that's why i say it's all about priority you really gotta know what to prioritize yeah. and when and also uh the, just keep things as simple as you can you know? yeah the, the goal is efficiency yeah, exactly. after all and uh i i do i've seen some trends right now in corporate in the corporate world even with big companies that they're just putting every, like all departments together with no walls, no office, yeah. you know, because they want that collaboration to happen because that's what at the end of the day takes the the wheel, you know, to run and create some uh, so value. During this season of layoffs, which makes sense, um, pretty much like all these companies, they know for a fact they have to do layoffs. And then for example, Meta was looking at their company structure and they're like, okay, wait a second, why do we have so many managers? First of all, mm. What are these managers managing? There's one manager for one manager. There's another manager for this manager. There's like a hundred different teams. So what did they do? They flattened it down. Mm. They really flattened it out. No more manager of no a manager. More, no more ladder to ladder to ladder, you know? And like, this is, this is also why like the corporate field is not, it, it's, it, it's, it's not always super nice. Like you might be like, you might be at the same company on two different teams. And it can be the complete different experience. And, and this is something that you don't get with a startup. Like when you're working with the same 10, 12 group of people, there's no room to be, for example, to have any kind of workplace toxicity or to not be completely honest. Like everyone has trust in each other because without like literally without everyone's contribution, nothing can get done, which is also what feels amazing. And what I, I found gave me a lot more motivation to push myself to learn as much as I could and to get things done quickly and correctly because I knew everyone is uh, giving me their trust in order to do the, in order to do this and I can't let them. Uh, you, you you do feel more of a team player when it's a smaller so, so group. So in the uh, sense of you know um, like working at a startup and everything, yeah. 
that when compared with corporate, which one do you think is more beneficial for somebody who might be interested in starting their own venture? Just from like a pure experience. I think uh, as long as you know, like as long as you do a little bit of research beforehand about what startup you're joining, what type of culture it is, I think definitely working at a startup has its, mm-hmm. has its clear benefits in terms of if you do want to start an venture, just because you uh before a company actually gets too big for you to understand how the things work together when you're in that small team i think the clear thing is looking at what are the what are the co-founders doing so for example at my startup my uh my uh, ceo he was constantly busy and the main thing he was busy with was actually he was one of the front runners in terms of interacting with potential and direct clients and he because um because our company is so small we obviously don't have a huge sales team. He is one of the primary sales sales team members because he knows his product the best. And he will sit on call with a potential client, eat, like even if it's for 30, 40, 50 minutes, and sell the product. And regardless if they get it or not, he is the best person to do so. And I think that's one thing that uh, uh, I kind of learned is that like the CEO, especially, there's no room to be... Uh, um, not like not getting your hands dirty. You really need to be incorporated in every single aspect and be on the same page with every single person. Right. And when you're in a team like that, you learn a lot and you exactly. you get a lot of experience and that you will eventually take Especially into your own venture, you know? Okay, so, yeah, like a small business because the biggest CEOs, right, they don't start as a big CEO. They have to really do all of the grunt works themselves and yeah, exactly. be at that position to every every single startup was at the same point somewhere like, yeah. exactly you know they they were contemplating is this going to work this has already been done before how are we going to get this done they put in the growing right they and in the work and constant iterations like regardless of what setbacks you just got to keep going you have to add to your luck you have to grab what you can and keep adding it on and eventually one thing will line up that yeah. lead to another thing lining up. It's all a huge rolling snowball. And the thing is like, we, we, the thing you have to realize is yes, we'll all, we will literally all start as the tiniest fleck of snow. But as we keep reaching out and grabbing towards the right things, meeting the right people, learning the right, uh, like uh, prioritizing what to learn, it'll all come rolling down, you know? Right, and it's, it's just about, uh, destination. Ex- exponential growth uh, exactly. from just the very little mundane things that yeah. gotta be done every single day. Yeah. And uh, just to touch base on that, I know that Waterloo has a crazy competition when it comes to grabbing co-ops, grabbing right these positions. How, how were you able to secure these positions and also help other people? Because I know that you uh, oftentimes help people with their resumes, with their uh, with presenting themselves into the uh, work, into a job market. Yeah, so like, <clears throat> I think that's, um, there's a lot to go into that, but I'll, 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 give a, I'll give a general idea. So regardless if you're from Waterloo or not, I think a lot of, um, a lot of students really, uh, I mean, the right word is not really slack off, but they don't understand their potential as a university student because the matter of fact is university is the only time in your career and your life where companies will offer to take a loss on you as an internship just because uh, you're a university student and potentially you can come back full time. So regardless of if you're in a co-op program or not, you're going to have your summers off. You're going to have four summers off. Imagine the difference if you're graduating as a, uh, just a regular degree, if, and if you do one internship right before you graduate versus if you've already done three of them, you know, like, yeah. it's such a big difference. And I think the key part is taking what you have to the absolute advantage, like using using what you already have, using what you already know, and just using it to its max potential. If you just, I think, networking from a young age getting, uh, just talking with people that are more experienced than you and getting this information. Number one, it'll help you align yourself with the kind of career you want to get into. So you can be like, okay, I've done these sort of projects. Um, I've done this sort of coursework or experience. And I've talked with some industry professionals in 
maybe one of the fields I like. Now that you actually talk to the industry professional, they can give you a bit of context and you can start to connect these, these, these things together. And um, once you can specify or at least uh, kind of uh, target one specific career path or one specific job, then it gets into the resume creation. This is when you really have to treat it as, uh, as an advertisement because all these large companies, they're not taking anything personally. They're putting your resume through a scanner. It's literally just pure efficiency and it's all, it's all pretty much a game when you think about it because they're getting so, some jobs have six, 7,000 applications. They're hiring maybe five, five interns or something like that. And that shouldn't discourage you at all because at the end of the day, they're still hiring five interns. Only five interns will get hired and there will be five interns that get hired. You know, like uh, it's purely just about looking at the job descriptions, looking at what things you can tweak on your resume, looking at how you can align yourself and really marketing yourself. So, uh, I guess I could give a couple quick resume tips and points. Yes, please. Yeah. So like, uh, um, I think everyone's pretty much heard this, but every resume point should be, um, kind of a verb or word to use to show like either optimize, develop, created this or that, start off with that. It should be what you did and it's direct quantifiable impact or, um, just general impact but i think most of your resume points at least 60 to 70 percent should have some quantifiable impact which, which is what i see uh a lot of people don't have and i think the main reason is because they're worried oh uh, like uh, how do i come up with these numbers like where are people getting these numbers well the thing is that no one like you are the best person to know what these numbers are your manager is not keeping that close of an eye on you where he's like I'm going to go back to resume. I'm going to make sure this 63% is at exactly 63%. No, that's fine. You're going to make abstractions from the work you did. And for example, if you did some sort of, some sort of work that saved the accounting department, each person in the accounting department, 10 hours per year. Okay. Let's say something very simple like that. Well, those 10 hours add up. What is your average accountant get paid hourly? You know, if the average accountant gets paid hourly $30, your department has 40 people then it's, uh, then it's 30, uh, 30 whole, uh, $20,000. Yeah. So it's, 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 it's a lot of money overall. And then you could say, you know, uh, created X feature, saving each account at 30 hours, saving the company X amount of money in annual costs. You really have to look at the abstractions where you can and put them together to find some sort of metric. And that's how you really, uh, really market yourself because it, it, it is about quantifying your own exactly. work. You, your role is to make this company money that you're applying to. So they got to see that number one, like you can get the work done. And number two, that you being on this team is going to help us make money and going to help us be more efficient or like some sort of metric that they can rely on. Because recruiters, they ultimately are looking for how is this person going to bring value to our company, right? Sweet. So it does make sense that you're just offering the facts so they just relate those numbers into their own situation right people think it's it, it's almost kind of silly adding all these numbers and stuff but the matter of fact is like like you said we're only here to make money for another company they're just going to try to find the candidate that can make them the most amount of money that can onboard the fastest because if it takes three months to onboard like let's say a full-time engineer they're going to try to find someone that oh it looks like maybe this person could be they, they have more technical space blah 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 it, it, it'll only take two months to onboard them. We save a month of cost, you know, yeah. and, and, and it's a pretty big deal. So sometimes just to uh, think from the company's perspective, as in if you are the person hiring um, for this position, who are you going to be hiring? Somebody yeah. Yeah. who has the metrics, like you yeah. said, to show, you know, the effectiveness of their work or somebody who dressed up their resume with things that doesn't go into any specifics about yeah. their job. Yeah, for sure. All right. All right. So uh, let's take another break right here and we'll be right back. 